as you know, we've got a group that's on a missions trip up to Montana, and they are, from what I understand, just crossing into the Wyoming uh, border. So let's keep them in our prayers this morning as we proceed with our service. And if you would, let's pray right now. Lord, we just thank you so much for the blessings that you've given to us. Thank you for watching over each and every one of us and for bringing us here together this morning. Lord, we pray for our pastors. We pray for our youth group and the, the sponsors that are on this trip. We just ask that you would protect them. And we pray that you would keep them close to you, Lord. And we just ask that you would be a very real presence in their lives and in the lives of the people they come in contact with during their trip. And Lord, I pray for us here this morning and ask that you'd speak to our hearts. We thank you again for your presence here and in our hearts, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated, please. And let's sing another hymn, hymn 376. 376. I have decided to follow Jesus. And we'll sing the first and the last word. 376. Well, good morning. I'm glad each of you are here this morning. If you have your Bibles with you, we're going to start at the beginning. If you would turn over into the book of Genesis, we are going to start off studying one of my favorite characters in Scripture. Um, for the next couple of weeks, I hope you all will bear with me. I'll be uh, bringing the Sunday morning, the, the Sunday school message on behalf of Pastor Will. Um, and I wanted to pick something that um, was going to be exciting to me. I wanted to pick something that would be fun to teach on. And at the last minute, I decided it might be smart for me to pray about it and ask the Lord what he wanted me to talk about. And so he really laid this on my heart, the study of Joseph. And again, it, it, it's neat because I really like this character. I think there's an awful lot for us to learn as we study him. So there is so much here that we could probably preach just on Joseph or teach on Joseph rather for, for weeks and weeks. But I'm going to try to hit on the early parts of his life as we go through this study together. So again, if you would, while we're going through this, please be sure that you keep our, our youth group and our pastors in your prayers. Um, they traveled all night. Um, several people have the ability to track them on their phones and um, they just kept on going. So they... They left early yesterday morning, and like I said, they're just crossing into Wyoming. But keep them in your prayers. They've, they've made really good time. They should be getting to the camp soon. Wow. But, but we will continue to keep them in our prayers. So we're going to study Joseph, life's up and downs. If, if you've ever wondered, if you've ever gone through life and said, my goodness, it just seems like I'm on a roller coaster. I mean, first uh, things are great, and then they're lousy, and then they're great, and then they're lousy. Uh, if you want an example in Scripture of just that, here you go. Joseph is, is the place to look. And so there's a couple of sources that I use to get the information for this. Um, one of them is a really good book that I will encourage all of you, if you haven't read it. Chuck Swindoll wrote a book on Joseph. Um, he's actually got several characters in Scripture um, that he's got an entire study on. And so a lot of information comes from this book. But then first and foremost, obviously, Scripture is going to be our source as we go through this. Um, it is really nice to be able to speak. I, I spend a lot of time at work speaking on different topics. It's really nice when I'm speaking about scripture because if I don't know what to say, I can just read right out of the book and that's okay uh, because it's a solid source and we'll use this as our primary source during our study. It's interesting, we talk about a lot of the times how we really need to make sure that we use scripture as the source for our information, as the one single source of truth. And a lot of times you'll hear people say, we need to make sure that we check what we hear with scripture. It was interesting, just a couple of weeks ago, 
I was driving through the Houston area and I was listening to a Christian radio station that was a counselor that was taking calls from the public. And as the counselor was talking, someone called in and said, uh, I just wanted to know, it was a lady who called in, and she said, I wanted to know if it's okay scripturally for me to get married because I divorced my cheating husband several years ago, and I'm thinking about getting married, and I wonder what does scripture say about that? And I was really shocked at the answer because this Christian counselor said, well, really the government is the source that God has used to give us direction on what we should do in that case. And my jaw dropped. I tried to stay on the road. I said, you've got to be kidding me. That's not what scripture says. If that's the case, then abortion must be okay because the government says it's okay. I thought that was awful. I think it's important for us to make sure when we're hearing things that we compare it with scripture to make sure that we're looking at a solid source. So we'll always look to scripture. So let's look a little bit at the life of Joseph. As we, as we study Joseph, we could really take his life and divide it into several pieces, a lot of people would think about Joseph like this. Most of us, when we think of Joseph in Scripture, we think of Joseph in the coat of many colors. Now, we, we know that, you know, his brothers were a little jealous. We know the story. We've heard it for years and years. So many of us today, when we think of Joseph, this is what we think of initially. But a lot of people would think of Joseph this way. There's several people that thought of Joseph as the guy who's always in trouble. And he's in jail quite a bit. I mean, there's something always going on with this guy. And he met several people in these situations, obviously, that he wouldn't have otherwise if he didn't have some of those ups and downs during his roller coaster life. But the majority of people that knew Joseph back during the day knew him like this. This is the Joseph that they knew. His name was Zaphnath Paeania. I hope I said that right, because that was the name that Pharaoh gave to him. But he was the second most powerful person in Egypt and was a man who would have a fantastic impact on the entire nation as well as his family. But this is the man that we're going to study. Quite a whirlwind that he went through to go through his life. But let's see what we can kind of pull out as we go through his life. So first off, we're going to start with a quick overview. If you wanted to divide Joseph's life up into sections that we could study easily, you might do it this way. From, from his birth up until 17, he had kind of a life in transition. We, we remember this. We, we'll talk a little bit about the coat of many colors and the story that went behind that. He was learning, he was growing, and he was being prepared by God for great things that would happen. After that, from age 17 to 30, we see that Joseph had really a crazy life full of ups and downs, full of some fantastic ups and downs where you almost can't imagine somebody going from one extreme to the other, as we'll see. But yet again, we're going to see that Joseph stood firm during these times and again was being prepared for what was going to happen later on in his life. Then the vast majority of Joseph's life from age 30 until a ripe old age of 110, he spends here. He spends serving the nation of Egypt and his family and, and his God, and we're going to see how he does that and how God works with him through this process. So as we do this, we're going to start off with a little bit of history, a little bit of history, because I think it's important to know how this whole situation started. As we study the first part of Joseph's life, we're going to see that he's going to have a difficult time, and we're going to see that some things are taking place in his family that are almost difficult to understand. I think it's important if you look back a little bit at, at how we got to where we were when we pick up the story with Joseph and, and his Technicolor coat. It'll help to put some of this into perspective. So let's look a little bit about that. If you'll turn to Genesis chapter 37. Genesis 37 and verses 3 and 4. We're going to kind of kick off this morning. Genesis 37, starting with verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. When his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. If you've got several kids, sometimes you feel like that's the case at home, right? And some of us with other brothers and sisters sometimes felt like that on occasion. Some of them different here in this family. This hatred runs pretty deep. And I think it's important to talk a little bit about how we got here. Back in Genesis chapter 27, 
in Genesis chapter 27, we're going to kind of see this story kick off. And the first blank that you've got, if you picked up your notes, is right there. A beloved son who was hated. Back in chapter 27, we see the story of Joseph's dad, Jacob, stealing the birthright from his brother Esau by putting hairy animal skins on his arm and tricking his blind and, and dying father. That's important. There's, there's a family history that we're going to see as we work through here um, to get to the, the time of Joseph and his brothers. In chapter 28, Isaac tells Jacob to take a wife from the daughters of Laban. So Jacob obeyed, and he said that he would work for seven years for the young lady that he had fallen in love with, Rachel. And he worked a hard seven years, got married, and lo and behold, the next morning after his wedding night, he realized, this, this is not Rachel. This is Rachel's older sister, who's not quite as cute as Rachel is. And he said, what happened? I've been tricked here. I've been duped. I kind of wonder, as I read through this, how he felt, how Jacob felt as he was sitting there that next morning thinking, you know what? This is just wrong. This is cheating. This is trickery, which is kind of what I did to my dad. I mean, there's a history here moving forward. He knows that he's kind of done the same thing. But he makes a decision to continue working with Laban for seven more years so he can marry the young lady that he wants to marry. And so he marries Rachel. Seven years later in Genesis chapter 29, verses 27 and 28. Chapter 29, verses 27 and 28. Laban tells him, Fulfill her week and will give thee this also for the service which thou shalt serve with me yet another seven years. He was pretty committed. Seven years plus another seven years. Fourteen years is a long time to stay in one job, isn't it? But he was focused on being able to marry Rachel. And Jacob did so and fulfilled her week and gave him, and he gave him Rachel, his daughter, to wife also. So he finally gets to the point now where he's going to marry Rachel. But something happens. Skip down to verse 30, and you're going to see that not everything is rosy here at home. In verse 30, we see, And he went in also unto Rachel, and he loved also Rachel more than Leah. And served with him yet seven other years. Here's a reason, one of many reasons to just have one wife, right? <laughs> if, if you've got favorites with kids, it's one thing. I'm, I'm assuming favorites with wives would be a lot worse. And yet that's what happened here. Um, Leah is going to bear Jacob some sons. And of course in this culture and this time, it was very important to have children. But it was very important to have sons. And so Leah, the less favorite of the two wives, has four sons. We see that an extremely, extremely jealous Rachel is going to try to figure out what should I do here. And so she's going to ask her husband to father children through her handmaid, which is kind of an odd arrangement. And so she's going to get two sons from that. Then we're going to see Leah become jealous and say, oh, oh hold on. She's catching up with me here. We need to figure something out. Why don't you take my handmaid and give me, give me children through my handmaid? And so that happens. And he gets two more sons through that. Then Leah is going to bear two more sons and a daughter. And you've got Rachel here the whole time who has yet to have children. And scripture tells us that God looked upon her and her situation and he allowed her to have children. And she will have two children that she will bear to Jacob. The first one they're going to call Joseph, who's the, the primary focus of our study. And the second one is going to be named Benjamin. And Rachel will actually die during childbirth, bringing Benjamin into this world. So you're going to have a very grief-stricken father who's bringing this family forward, a very dysfunctional family, to say the least. But he's trying to rally these kids around, bring them through life. There's no question this family needed some counseling at this point, right? I mean, things are tough in this family. In chapter 34, if you thought things were bad, they're going to kind of get a little bit worse here. In fact, they're going to get a lot worse, I think. Start in chapter 4 with verse 1. We're going to see a tragic scene where Dinah, remember there was one daughter in this whole series of people. We're going to see that Dinah gets raped by the son of a prince of the country where the family is staying at that point. A tragic event happens. In verse 5 of chapter 34, we read this. And Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter. Now his sons were with his cattle in the field, and Jacob held his peace until they were come. Fact of the matter is, he, he held his peace a little bit longer than that. 
the fact of the matter is he really didn't do anything here. Um, he held back. He didn't say what needed to be said. He didn't do what needed to be done. Um, you have a, a father who's in a difficult position and chose to just let it work itself out, I guess. And it didn't work itself out. Because when his sons got home, in verse 7, it, we read, And the sons of Jacob came out of the field when they heard it, and the men were grieved, and they were very wroth, because he had wrought folly in Israel and lying with Jacob's daughter, which thing ought not to be done. Uh, the sons came back, and they knew this is wrong. This should not have happened. And I'm sure they were a little frustrated, saying, Dad, do something. What are you going to do? And he didn't do anything. So what happens when that's the case? Well, in some cases, as in this case, the boys decided we're just going to take matters into our own hands. We're not going to let this stand. This is wrong. And if we look over, by the time we get to verse 25, the sons have devised a plan. They have said this is not going to happen. That's our sister, and, and she needs to be treated better than that. Um, they have devised, by verse 25, a plan to murder the instigator of this act, but not just him. Every single man in the entire city. And they're going to take all the women and all their possessions. They are going to make sure that no one messes with their family again. And this is when we see Jacob get upset. Because he's saying, hey, <laughs> now everybody in the cities around us is going to think poorly of me. And I'm sure the sons were saying, dad, we're thinking poorly of you for not doing something about what happened to our sister. There is dysfunction taking place here. There is a lot of distrust. There's a lot of deviousness. Um, and a murderous group of boys that we see who, who have taken matters into their own hands. That, again, is what Jacob got mad about, about the fact that his boys went out and did this. In chapter 35, verse 22, we're then going to see that one of these boys, after Rachel's death, Reuben, is going to have an incestuous relationship with his stepmother. And once again, Jacob heard about it and did nothing. And so that really is where we start to pick up this story. We've got a family that's got some problems. Things are not going well, and they're about to go worse. And I want to point out that I think here we need to talk a little bit about the poison of passivity. Dads especially. We've got a responsibility with our families. If we choose to do nothing, we're in essence co-conspirators, if you will. Texas law, federal law, says if you see a crime and you do nothing, you can be charged, right? So much more so as parents, if we see something happening in our families and choose to do nothing, we're allowing uh, the evil one to have his way in our family. And we can't do that. Um, in this day and age, the message is here for us that we can't turn a blind eye to what's going on in our families. We need to call our children out. This is a message to me. When we see things happening, a lot of times it's easy to say, you know what, it's been a long day. Maybe I'll deal with this tomorrow or this weekend. I'll take care of it and put it off. We need to deal with those things quickly. We need to make sure that we're fulfilling our role as parents and especially as fathers. If we love our kids, they need to hear from us. Do you agree with that? If we love them, we can't mince words when it comes to sin either. We need to call it what it is. We need to call it what it is. The next blank here is the cruelty of jealousy. The cruelty of jealousy. You know, Scripture tells us that we shouldn't let the sun set on our anger. And, and my wife, Barbara, and I talk about that on a regular basis. There have been times we've been upset and we'll stay up pretty late <laughs> because we're trying to work something out. But we have, we have made a decision that we're not going to go to sleep mad at each other. And again, sometimes it's maybe two or three in the morning before we work it out. But we're going to work it out. Why is that? I think that's because if you go to sleep angry, a couple of things are going to happen. You might just be thinking about it all night. You might not be able to sleep, so you're just festering. The next morning, I tell my kids, by the next morning, you might have forgotten about it. And you might forget to apologize. You might forget to say what you had kind of realized in the middle of the night you needed to say. And so then it just goes unsaid because you may forget and get busy the next day. So you have left something unfinished. And it's going to sit there, and it's going to fester, and you're going to think about it. And the next time something comes up, if you didn't apologize last time, it's easier not to do it this time. And you allow Satan a foothold in your family, in your life. You allow that hatred to build, to turn into rage, to turn into worse things. And we see here that we've got a great deal of jealousy taking place in this family. If we go back to chapter 30, 
Take a look at Genesis 30 and verse 1. And we're going to see here a very jealous Rachel. Chapter 30, verse 1, and says, When Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, Give me children or else I die. <laughs> I think she was pretty serious. Come on, this is killing me not to have kids. You got to give me children. And bad decisions quickly were made because of the jealousy and the envy that she felt in her heart. All these back and forth jealousy between these two wives. By chapters 37, by chapter 37, if you flip over to Genesis 37, verses 3 and 4, we see that this has now been passed on to the next generation. And in chapter 37, verse 3, we see, Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. Uh-oh, there we go again. Favoritism, right? Because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. What's significant about a coat of many colors at that time? It was expensive. The, the impression we get from Scripture, this was a long coat too. This was a, more of a tunic. It, it, it would go down close to the ankles, which is significant because it's pretty hard to work if you got something that's long. The message to the brothers was, you guys work, and Joe's going to stay with me at home from Dan. He's going to stay here close to home. Y'all take care of the sweaty work, and Joe will be here, you know, chatting with Dan, whatever he's going to do. When his brethren saw in verse 4 that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. So we see now this has been passed on yet to another generation. He's played favorites with his two youngest sons, but especially Joseph, and that hatred has really spiraled out of control at this point. So what can we do? You know, with my kids, we've got a lot of kids in my, in my family, and so sometimes I see a little envious take place. You know, somebody gets invited over to a cousin's house, and everybody's saying, why didn't I get to go? Or somebody gets to go to grandma's house, well, why didn't I get to go? Well, it's because there's 35 of you. You know, you can't all go at the same time. You know, just a few can go at a time. And so it's important, you know, for us to try to make sure that we explain to our kids and sit down and say, no, 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 it's not so. Look, you know, we love all you guys. Sometimes this one gets to go. Sometimes you'll get to go. But we don't try to make it even, Stephen. At the same time, we tell our kids, you know, I, I have relatives that make sure they spend the exact amount of money on every Christmas gift. You're going to get seventeen thirty-five dollars worth of presents, and so are you, and so are you. And they'll give them the change sometimes just to make sure everybody's even. We tell kids, life's not fair. I understand that. Life's not fair. But at the same time, we got to make sure that everyone feels loved. And if we see little tinges of frustration or envy or jealousy, we have to address those fast. We have to take care of it quick. What happens if we haven't done that? What happens if you're sitting here and you're thinking, you know what, I've got some of this happening in my family and I should have dealt with it a long time ago. And I haven't. What do we do? Is there hope for us? And I would say yes, there is. Because the next one is the power of prayer. Now, Scripture doesn't tell us specifically that he did this, but I can't help but believe that Jacob prayed about this. We know that he followed God. We know that he knew these things were happening, even if he didn't do something. And I can't help but think that he spent time praying um, for peace, praying for wisdom, although he, he seemed like he kind of backed away from taking action on whatever wisdom he was given in these situations. But I think that he probably spent some time praying. And I would, I would go way out on a limb and say he may at some point have prayed, God, just let all these things work out in the end. Just let them work out in the end. Those of us that have read ahead know that a lot of ways they did work out in the end. Not as pretty as they might have been otherwise. Uh, but God answers prayer. And there's no question that we can spend time when we're having difficulties at home in prayer asking the Lord to help us and to give us wisdom in these things. But first we're going to focus a little bit on what happens here to Joseph. So let's, let's take a little bit of time. Joseph decided to go talk to his brothers. He's a sharp kid, by the way. I mean, Joseph's a sharp guy. God has blessed him. The hand of God is on this young man. I don't know if he knows it at this point specifically, but he knows that he has gifts. If you have several kids and one of them is good at something <clears throat> and goes to the other ones and says, hey, watch this, how does that usually go over? <laughs> Whatever, you know. Hey, look, I got this great piano piece I want to play. And the other ones that aren't so good, no, I think I'd rather go play somewhere else, you know. Or look what I can do here. One of my girls is in gymnastics now, and so she'll say, hey, look how far I can stretch this way. And the other girl's are like, eh, well, maybe I can't do that. 
Then we can build a little jealousy when people are trying to show each other up, right? I don't think Joseph was trying to do that here in, in verse 5. But Joseph dreamed a dream, and he wanted to tell his brothers about it. And so he went up to him, and he said, hey, guys, listen, can I, can I tell you something? Can I tell you about this dream I had? And I'm sure the answer he got was, no, no, <laughs> we don't want to hear it. Go back to dad. You know, we're over here working. We're doing men's work over here. No, 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 no. Listen, I got a story to tell you. I got a story to tell you. And so in chapter 37, verse 5, Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren. And what happened? How did they respond? Hey, thanks for telling us about that, Joe. Man, that puts everything in perspective. We appreciate that. No, that's not what it says. He told his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. Why? Well, because he told a story about, hey, we were all out there in the fields, and we were all bundling up the sheaves. And you know what? Mine was standing there, and all y'all sheaves bowed down to mine. Isn't that cool? How do you think his brothers responded to that? I think they probably looked something like this. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? I'm sure they had choice words for him. These are rough, tough men, by the way. Remember that. I'm sure they had some pretty choice words for Joseph. And so Joseph, being the wise young man, took the hint and said, Boy, I had another dream, too. Let me tell you about the next one. Let me tell you about the next one. It was even cooler. You know, all the stars, there were, there were stars for each of you and the moon and the sun, and they all bowed down to me. Now, Dad heard this one. And even dad got in on the action here and said, seriously, are you trying to say that I'm going to bow down to you? I don't think so. And his father rebuked him for the dream. But it says here in scripture, but his dad thought about that. He thought about that because I think his dad realized there may be something to this. This is a sharp young man. He's been hanging around the house a lot lately, and I think he's pretty sharp. So we've got an issue here. By verse 18, when we get down here, Joseph is walking out to meet his brothers to check on them. They had gone off with the sheep. And where they're shepherding, dad realizes there's something specific about this area where they've taken the sheep. It's the same place where this whole scenario with his daughter and the murder of all these guys took place. And that's where they took the sheep today. And something tells me dad was a little anxious about that. And he said, hey, hey you know what, Joseph? Where did you say they went? Would you go check on them real quick? Let's just make sure everything's okay. Probably should have thought that through a little bit more, right? I mean, especially after the whole situation with the dreams. If he'd been paying attention to his boys, maybe he would have realized all they were talking about when they were walking away wasn't where can we get good grass for the sheep. It was, I hate that brother of ours. I just hate him. And he just sent him off into the lion's den, didn't he? He sent his son out there. And by verse 18, his brothers are planning to kill him. They're planning to kill him. What was unique to me as a kid growing up listening to this story was thinking, how could brothers decide they wanted to kill this guy? How, how could they do that? How could they do it? This is a group of boys, this is a group of men who have killed before. It's not that big a deal for them. So he's our brother, but we hate him anyway. I mean, it's not unheard of in their mind to be able to make the pieces connect to get rid of this guy and, and get him out of their hair. Excuse me, get him out of their hair. So they're pretty creative. At least Reuben, at least the oldest son, convinced him, hey, hey, you know what? Let's not kill him. Let's throw him in the pit. So Reuben, for all the, the evil in his heart, just like his brother, says, spare his life, let's put him in a pit. And in his mind, he's thinking, later on when they're distracted, I'm going to yank him out of the pit and send him home to dad. And we'll, I'll just beat him up later or something, you know, but we'll, we'll just take care of him. Unfortunately, when Reuben's out, probably dealing with a sheep, and gets back later on and looks in the pit, Joseph's not there. Hey, what happened to Joseph? They said, no, we sold him into slavery. Look, here's your money. We didn't get much for him. We told him we'd make a good deal. We, we sold him for what you would pay for a sick, old slave. That's what we sold our brother for. And we see in Scripture that Reuben was heartbroken over that. He tore his clothes and said, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? i got to face Dad. I mean, I'm the oldest brother. But what did he do? He did what he'd learned, I think, from his predecessors, and he did nothing. And he, he kept the story going. He said, you know what, I'll carry the conspiracy to my death knowing that no one is ever going to find out what happened to little Joseph, that pain of a little brother that just irritated us all this time. Jacob, how do you think dad reacts to the news? He's devastated. He's devastated. And he tells his family, you know what? I'm going to mourn him until I die. And he's virtually inconsolable. Well, mission accomplished for the boys, right? Um, he says he's just going to mourn. 
Unbeknownst to Jacob, though, a very live Joseph has been sold into Potiphar over in Egypt a couple days later. And he's been sold to Potiphar, who's the captain of the guard for Pharaoh himself. Let's think about that for a second. I think there's a little bit of importance in who it is that he got sold to. Do we see God's hand moving in this process? I think so. He could have been sold to anybody. You know, these guys could have said, hey, we got them cheap. We'll sell them cheap. It's no big deal. You know, <laughs> make, make a little bit of profit. We're okay. But I, I have to think, this is me reading a little bit in the scripture, so bear with me. I have to think that even these guys that sold him or that purchased him from the brothers in the trip to Egypt said, it's a pretty sharp kid. It's a pretty sharp guy. He's really handsome too. I mean, really handsome. We see that in scripture. We'll talk about that in a second. And so they figured, hey, we can get a pretty good price for this guy. And lo and behold, who purchased him but the captain of the guard? This is the chief of the musketeers, if you will. Um, this is the, the head knight of the round table. This is the guy whose job it is to protect the king. And so he has special authority. He is he's one of those people who you have an equal respect, hopefully, of respect and fear for when you see him walking around town because you don't want to cross this guy. He's got special authority to do what it takes to protect the king. Um, and he would have extreme authority to do that. They're, we're not going to send you over to court. Uh, we'll just deal with it right now because his function is to protect the king. He's an important guy. It's clear that a man in a position like Potiphar would be an intelligent man. There's no question. You can't get to that position otherwise. He's got a wife. He's got a household. He's got multiple slaves. He's apparently doing well. And he's also got this brand new slave that he has just purchased who's going to come into his home and help him. In chapter 39 and verse 2, we're going to see an important comment. If we back up to verse 1, Joseph was brought down to Egypt and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph. One of my favorite phrases. We're going to see this a lot. The Lord was where? He was with Joseph. And he was a prosperous man and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. There's something different about this young man. What was it that was different? The Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. God has been keeping an eye on this young man. We're going to see that by getting serious about serving God, God is with Joseph. And he's going to be with him throughout all this. Joseph has kind of the Midas touch. Everything he touches just turns to gold. I mean, everywhere this young man goes, things go well. The story gets pretty funny in some places because literally everywhere he goes, it's not long before people say, put this guy in charge. I mean, he's honest, he's trustworthy and smart as I'll get out. There's just something about this guy. Uh, by verse 5, he's already in charge of Potiphar's entire household. Think about that. He is now the chief of staff for the captain of the guard. This is a pretty important guy. Lots of important people are coming in and out of Potiphar's house, probably on a regular basis. And he's responsible for all the little details. In fact, Potiphar trusts him, Scripture tells us, with everything, so that all Potiphar has to worry about is what he wants to eat. Everything else, Joseph's taking care of. Everything. He's got access to the money. He's got access to everything. And he's trusted with everything. And, and Potiphar's got an eye on him. He's saying, this, this young man is pretty sharp. But Potiphar's not the only person that's got an eye on Joseph. His wife's got an eye on this guy, too. She's been watching him. This was a handsome, strong, intelligent young man, right? How handsome? I, I mentioned that earlier. How handsome was Joseph? Verse, chapter 39, verse 6. Look at me here real quick. And he left all he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught he had save the bread which he did eat. And, and we're talking about Potiphar there. And Joseph was a goodly person and well-favored. How does that translate? There's other translations that say that he was handsome in form and appearance, that he was well-built and handsome. This was a good-looking young man. Good-looking. How good-looking? Let me ask you a question. Who are the most handsome men in Scripture? <laughs> There's a trivia question. What do you think? Who are the handsome men in the Bible? David, Saul, and one more. Not Jesus. Good looking on the inside, but not necessarily on the outside. One of Solomon's sons. Absalom. The, the words that are used in Scripture to describe Joseph are only used four times in the Old Testament. It's for Joseph, David, Saul, 
and Absalom. This is a good-looking young man. So good-looking that it's recorded here in Scripture for us. He'd have been on the front cover of the magazines, right? I'm sure people are going through Potiphar's house saying, hey, you know what, this place is really clean and sharp. (laughs) It's a good-looking slave we got over there. That guy's handsome. He's catching women's eye, and he's caught Potiphar's wife's eye too. Maybe this is part of the reason his brothers hated him. I'm just saying. You know, I'm just saying. So Potiphar's wife didn't mince words, did she? If you turn down to verse number 7, it says, And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. I mean, she didn't waste very much time, did she? And we know the story. Joseph gave us a great example of what to do. He said no. He just said no. And he didn't say it once. He said it over and over and over and over and over. And he wasn't caught off guard by her advances. I think that's an important thing to remember. He wasn't caught off guard by her advances. He didn't give in. He didn't slip up one time when she said it different than she had the other times. He, he didn't get tripped up. How do we do that? Men, women too, how do we do that? I think one of the ways we do that is we prepare ourselves ahead of time for that. We practice what we're going to say when somebody says something like, hey, what do you think? Nobody's watching. No. We practice saying no fast. And that's what he did here. He refused. He refused. In verses 8 and 9, if you look at chapter 39, verse 8, what does it say? But he refused. He refused. Not that he thought about it. Not he said, well, you know what? He didn't, he didn't kind of dilly-dally a little bit. He didn't play a little tease game with her. No, he refused. He refused. And he said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wadeth not what is in me in all the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. I can't do this to him. There's none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but you. Why? Because you're his wife. I can't do this. And much more important, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He's got his priorities straight. No, ma'am. This is not going to happen. And he's told her over and over and over again. And so we see here the importance of resisting temptation. The importance of resisting temptation. I'm going to kind of skim through here because we're almost out of time. Important not to be weakened by your situation. Don't let them break you down. Again, if you have kids, do your kids break you down sometimes? Do they wear you down sometimes? Do you find yourself finally giving in to something when you said no about a dozen times? What is it that made us give in that 13th time or that 25th time or that 2,000th time? (laughs) What is it? Just get tired of saying no. You know what? Fine already. Thank God Joseph didn't give in here. He didn't give in. He resisted over and over again. And so by verse 11, now she set a trap for this young man. She said, you know what? I'm going to get what I want. And by verse 11, she has decided that she's going to make sure there's nobody home. You know, maybe it's that there were other people around. Maybe Joseph is just worried about what the other servants are going to think. I can take care of that. She's thinking to herself... I can get them all out of the house, send them all on errands, make sure Potiphar's busy. Maybe he's off, you know, with the king someplace. Um, This is going to be perfect. I've got it all worked out. So what happened? We see that Joseph decided that he wasn't going to have anything to do with this. In verse 12, she caught him by his garment and said, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. He got him out. (laughs) He just left. He ran. I mean, he literally ran. He didn't care. He just ran out the door. Once again, I think it's pretty important for us to bear that in mind as a good response to temptation. But Mrs. Potiphar is not too happy about this. She's not a lady to be trifled with. And she decided, you know what, no, I'm going to have the last laugh here. And so she set up a story where she said, you know what, I've been attacked. I've been attacked by this young man. He tried to take advantage of me. Who's there to corroborate her story? Nobody, right? So who comes back first? I'm assuming some of the servants might have gotten home first. Can you believe what happened? Oh, yes, ma'am. I, it, that's awful. I, you know, <laughs> they like their job. They're slaves, remember? By the time Potiphar gets home to say, what in the world am I hearing all this nonsense about? Who knows? She may have several people saying, you know what? I knew this was going to happen. I don't know. But whatever she says, we don't know. But what we do know is that she gave a false report against Joseph, and Potiphar was not happy about it. In fact, he's pretty mad, as you'd expect. And what does he do? In verse 19, 
came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife that she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me that his wrath was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. Threw him in prison. Wow. Joseph did the right thing. He did the right thing, and look what happened. Look what happened to him. Interesting. Let me ask you a question. Did Potiphar believe Joseph, do you think? I'm going to get off on a little rabbit trail here. You think Potiphar believed Joseph? I personally, I kind of think he did, at least a little bit. Why? Remember Potiphar's position. He's got the power of life and death in his hands, right? And consider the situation. A slave just attacked the master's wife, a high-ranking official. It's, it's execution time. I mean, we're not going to put up with this. Why would he throw him in prison? There's just a part of me, I'm just saying... There's a part of me that thinks that Potiphar, whose whole career has been built on being able to, to detect the intentions of men, is able to detect that, I, I just can't imagine Joseph doing this. I just can't. I just can't. And for whatever reason, he's put in prison instead of being executed. I, I think there's a little something there. It's a good thing he made the right choice. Don't be deceived by the persuasion. Here's another thing I would just want to mention real quick. Joseph has had to put up with constant, constant, constant temptation. Nobody's ever going to know. It'll be just this one time. If you really care for me, if you really want to serve me, who knows? Constant, over and over again. Do we hear that today? Do we hear that today as we go through our lives? God forgives. We can just ask for forgiveness later. We'll be married pretty soon anyway. I mean, it's just one deceitful statement after another that bounces into our lives that, that Satan himself is trying to trip us up. He's trying to trip us up. We have to be sure that we're not deceived by the persuasion. He's very good at exploiting us. Remember, Satan's been studying human mental decision-making for thousands of years. He doesn't know what we're thinking, but he's got a pretty good idea because he knows how people think. And, and he attacks us when we're least expecting it. It's also say, don't be gentle with your emotions. We see that Joseph didn't try to say, you know what, now, Mrs. Potiphar, let's just talk about this. You know what, let's sit over here. Let's, let's have a little chat about this. He said, no, he ran out the door. He ran out the door. I think it's important to realize if he would have tried to have a conversation with her, it might have been too late by the time he was done. He was very quick. He was kind of rude, in fact. I mean, <laughs> it's rude to run away from your master's wife. It's rude to talk to her the way he did, but he's not having any of this. Sometimes we need to be careful and say, you know what, we're just going to do what's right regardless of the cost. We have to make sure that we make the right choice. He said what he needed to say, and when it continued, he fled and literally left the room with his coat hanging in her hands because he said, I'm having nothing to do with this. And the most important thing as we wrap this up, if there's a nugget to take from this, I think it's this. We have to be sure that we're not confused with the immediate results that we're not confused with the immediate results. Think about that for a second. What is going to happen? In Joseph's mind, what's about to happen? You know what? She's been after me day after day after day, and I have done the right thing. I've been a righteous man, and, and she came after me today, and I ran out the door. As soon as Potiphar gets home, I don't know how he's going to respond, but I will do a good job of explaining to him exactly what's happened. He knows that he's done the right thing, he knows that he has fled from temptation, and yet what happens? He finds himself in prison for doing the right thing, for going above and beyond to do the right thing. Did he do what was right? I mean, did he? Of course he did. Of course he did. He was falsely accused. He was punished for it. But let's think about this for a second. Did he do the right thing? Think about this for just a minute. Joseph did the right thing and got burned for it, right? Right? If he had given in to Mrs. Potiphar, he would not have been falsely accused, right? At least in the short term, things wouldn't have turned out this way. Maybe no one would have ever known, possibly. Maybe Mrs. Potiphar would have kept her end of the deal and kept everything quiet. And he would have stayed there in Potiphar's house until a ripe old age, maybe of 110, right? Somehow I doubt that. But you know what? Maybe she would have kept the deal and it would have been quiet. We... Unlike Joseph, important note, have the benefit of history to tell us what happened. Think about this. If Joseph would have given in, here's what probably would have happened. He wouldn't have gone to prison. 
Now, he might later on, if Potiphar found out what was happening with his wife, might have been worse. But he might have been executed, wouldn't he, at that point? If Potiphar caught him in the act of cheating with his wife, I don't think he would have gone to prison. If he had not gone to prison, he probably wouldn't have rubbed shoulders with a couple of very important high-level authorities in Pharaoh's uh, group. That never would have happened. He also would not be the one who had been called in to interpret Pharaoh's dream because he would have been a disgraced young man or he would have been the servant over in Potiphar's house who had no connection to interpreting dreams in the first place because remember that happened in prison at this point. If all of that had taken place, there's a good chance that we either have when the famine comes, we either have a dead Joseph or a Joseph who's over in Potiphar's house watching these events take place, unable to have any control in the matter whatsoever. He probably would not have been at that point in the place to influence what would have been the greatest natural disaster to strike that country since Noah's flood. There, he would have seen his family starve to death. He very well could have too, along with hundreds and hundreds of thousands of other people. All of this if Joseph had not said no, even that one last time. I think it's important for us to remember that we shouldn't ever be confused by the immediate results. God knows what's going to happen. How does he know that? Because scripture tells us that just like Joseph, we serve an almighty God, the same God that Joseph was serving there, a God who knows what's going to happen in the future. Why? Because he's there. He's watching it and he's controlling it as it happens just at the same time that he's watching us. Time has no bearing on him and his ability to control the lives of men and to act in the lives of men. He sees those future events. And so he knows our future because he's already there. And so when we're faced with the choice of doing the right thing or the wrong thing, frankly, it boils down to this. We need to remember that we serve a God who already knows how it's going to work out. He already does. So when things seem to arrange themselves and we think I don't have a choice but to do the wrong thing because I don't see how doing the right thing is going to get me where I need to be. Who can trust in the Lord? He's in control. He is the ultimate source of truth and he is, when you think about it, he is the only person who we can trust. The only one that we can trust. There is no other. And with that, let's pray. And we'll get going. Lord, I just want to thank you so much for the example that you have given us in Scripture of Joseph and the life of Joseph. Lord, I thank you that Scripture gives us real examples that we can apply to our own lives. Lord, we see a lot of ourselves in Joseph. We may see a lot of ourselves in Joseph's brothers or his father or his family. There's so many things here that relate to what happens in our lives today. There's nothing new under the sun. You've told us that. Lord, I pray that as we continue our study, as we continue the service this morning, that you would speak to us. I pray that you would continue to, to talk to us about the things that we need to pay attention to. Maybe there's something we need to focus on more. Maybe there's something that we need to change in ourselves. Maybe there's something that we need to call attention to with our kids. Maybe there's something that you're calling attention to us right now. Lord, I pray that you would continue to just keep us open to listening to your Holy Spirit and to the words that you have for us. I pray, Lord, as we continue to study next week the life of Joseph, that you would continue to show us that through the tough times in life, we can always depend on you. We can focus on you. And Lord, if there's one here this morning who just doesn't know what we're talking about, who's not sure how you could trust because they have not asked you to come into their life, I pray that they would do that today. I pray that they would come to realize that you, the God that created them and the universe, also offer forgiveness for sins and that you will come and you will forgive our sins and live in us and through us. And Lord, I pray is it that you would bring anyone with those questions to myself or one of the pastors or one of the deacons to talk this morning about that. We love you, Lord. We thank you for your blessings that you constantly give us. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much.